Hello, and welcome everyone to the closing plenary of the 2020 Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition EJ Summit. I'm Jamisa Johnson Greer, Climate Justice Director of MEJC. We at MEJC look forward to the summit every two years, and many of us have seen how the space has evolved to meet the needs of our EJ communities and to answer the call of that time. These last 10 months at MEJC have required us to rely on one another in order to grow, to be constantly speaking up on behalf of our people, and to be dauntless in our pursuit of a just transition. With that and the 30th anniversary of the first EJ Summit ever, we felt this moment too critical not to make the space we so desperately need in this time to heal, to know our history, and to claim the future that we want to see. This summit, in the context of all that we have endured and are still enduring in this year, reminded us of the significance of learning, of growing, of healing, and activating around the, some of the most important issues of our time and the need to create space to do so together. This format and this creation of this digital space was experimental. Uh, it was an opportunity to build community across the state and even though we can't physically be in each other's presence. So there aren't the same opportunities to bump into a familiar face between sessions or meet a new friend you find yourself sitting next to in multiple sessions, but somehow the summit still manages to cultivate those feelings of being re-energized and retooled for the fight ahead. And also being reminded that there is a community of folks who are fighting alongside you. Speaking of that community, our community has lost someone who's been very dear to many of us. Um, we have lost many EJ warriors over the years, um, and this one is no different and no less impactful, Mr. Cecil Corbin Mark. Many environmental justice warriors have learned from and with Cecil as he's left an indelible mark on our work the future of the movement through his commitment and his passion. And so we honor him today with a moment of silence. Please join me. Thank you. We will now have a musical reflection from Omar Aragonis. Thank you. 
gives me great honor to introduce our, our panelists today. I mean, it's just truly an honor to, to be in the same space with these folks. They work uh, hard and, and they are truly uh, examples of what it means to be advocates and to, to live through their work um, and to, to exemplify um, advocacy at grassroots levels. Um, and, and they're doing amazing things. And so uh, our first uh, panelist is Anthony Rogers Wright. Uh, he was selected as one of Grace's 50 people you'll be talking about in 2016. Anthony has over 10 years of policy analysis, community organizing, outreach, and advocacy experience while serving as policy analyst for various environmental consulting and urban planning firms in Colorado and California. He specialized in land use, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and environmental justice compliance. He has used his organizing outreach experience to advocate for a variety of social justice campaigns, including environmental justice, affordable healthcare access, income equality, and civil rights for LGBT citizens. In 2012, Anthony led the effort to make Colorado Health Insurance Cooperative the first health insurance provider in the state's history to remove transgender health exclusions from all of their policies. In 2016, he acted as a surrogate and policy advisor for the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign and testified on the need for increased action on climate justice and the importance of centering frontline communities to the DNC platform committee. Anthony served as a policy advisor for San Senator Sanders, Governor Jay Inslee and Senator Elizabeth Warren during the 2020 presidential election season. 
He's written numerous articles discussing the axiomatic nexus between climate crisis and social justice and spoken of this issue at universities throughout the United States and Europe. Anthony has earned his er undergraduate degrees in environmental science and policy and jazz composition, as well as his graduate degree in community development, environmental science and public policy from Clark University in Worcester, Ma Massachusetts. He currently serves as a policy coordinator for the Climate Justice Alliance and serves on the board of directors for Friends of the Earth Backbone Campaign and Center for Sustainable Economy, as well as the advisory board for Evergreen Action. Anthony is blessed to be the father of his energetic, entertaining, and very loquacious five-year-old son, Zaire Cielo, aka Bean. Sawati Salama Ra is no less impressive. A mother and organizer who was born and raised in Detroit, she grew up in the environmental justice movement and served as the co-director of East Michigan Environmental Action Council, or EMIAC. In addition to her work locally and across the country, Sawatu represented Detroit and the United States at global social justice and climate justice events in France, Turkey, and Senegal. She also led youth organizing and media justice work, including the Young Educators Alliance and Detroit Future Youth. In March of 2018, Sawachi was incarcerated for defending herself, her mother, and daughter. At the time, she was in her third trimester of pregnancy and was forced to give birth to her beautiful son during her imprisonment. After nearly nine months at Michigan Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility, Sawatu was released in November 2018 on bond in order to appeal her unjust conviction and was reunited with her family. In August 2019, she won her appeal and her conviction was reversed. In February 2020, she won her total freedom. She continues to advocate for the liberation and dignity of thousands of women and people inside Michigan's prisons, as well as organized for environmental justice, climate justice, and a world without prisons or militarism. If you wanna learn more about Sawatu's incredible story, check out freesawatu.org. Rebecca Williams is a member of the Pogowan Band of Potawatomi Indians. She was recently selected as one of the Rural Media Fellows for MEJC Action, and she loves her family and enjoys attending traditional ceremonies and doing and doings whenever possible. She is currently majoring in youth and community development at Western Michigan University, and she is passionate about policies, programs, and resources that address the disparities impacting her community, especially when they impact youth. Badaban Reinhardt is an Ashinabe Ojibwe citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. She recently graduated with her master's degree in sustainable construction from Southern New York University and is an alum of the Northern Michigan University. Currently, she lives in the UP and is also one of the Rural Action, Rural MEJC Action Fellows. I would like to introduce to you our esteemed panel. Anthony, I'm just making sure you can hear me. Yes. Great. Um, well, I mean, in terms of my uh, opening statements, I mean, let me just say um, how honored I am to be here. Um, you know, specifically um, seeing our sister Sawatu safe and healthy and powerful is always just a beacon of, of light for me. Um, a sister who I got to know last summer when I was working up in Detroit <clears throat> with MEJC, EMIAC, and um, other grassroots organizations, I got to meet Sister Sawatu. So it's just always just so great to, to see her uh, power and to see her safe and, and shining. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, y'all being in Detroit, uh, specifically, um, a, a zip code, the 48217, uh, which was um, infamous um, and, and now has been starting to get more shine from uh, people across the country who understand that the 48217 is a snapshot for so many uh, frontline Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities 
that are subjected to assaults on their public health by um, uh, in, uh, extractive industries like uh, the Marathon oil refinery. And, um, you know, where we're obviously in this age of a uh, global pandemic, uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. And as we like to say, and, and, and the folk um, in Detroit know this uh, as well, if not better than anyone, is that um, COVID-19 is really just a symptom of the larger diseases of white supremacy, patriarchy, and colonization. Um, it's a great elucidator. It is a magnifying glass that is really um, showcasing even more the interlinked crises that were well in existence <clears throat> before the uh, pandemic got to the shores of the United States of America, to Turtle Island, um, and, and really just exacerbating uh, many of the existing oppressions that were in place. Um, you talk about you know, a, a, a city uh, where there were still water shutoffs at a time when we were being told by healthcare officials that the best way to keep yourself safe is to wash your hands and to constantly wash your hands. And folk um, are having their water shut off because um, a pandemic is increasing poverty at a time when folk are, are working hard just to pay the bills and survive, you know, much less thrive. And then you're, you're gonna shut off their water. So uh, they, they cannot keep themselves sanitized they can't prepare food, they can't keep themselves warm. Um, that, that's the state that we're in um, right now as frontline Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. Um, uh, we, we have obviously a um, autocratic um, fascist um, regime that is currently uh, occupying um, the, the, the White House right now. And here we are um, a week away from um, election season and we're, we're dealing with a pandemic, we're dealing with voter suppression and just the everyday um, emissions that are um, slowly choking us out. As I like, and, and, and of course, Detroit also experienced this summer, um, you know, police more police brutality um, that goes back to the, you know, the, the legacy of the riots that took place and whatnot. And so I've, I, as I, I've always said to members of Congress who I've had the opportunity to speak to for Black, Brown, and Indigenous, and even some poor white folk, you know, we're being choked out by toxic policies, we're being choked out by toxic police, and we're being choked out by toxic emissions all at the same time. And so that's the, uh, uh, the, the rough reality that we're dealing with. However, um, what we've also uh, are starting to see, I mean, what we've known as frontline grassroots for a long time is that our solutions are starting to be scaled out. Our solutions are starting to finally get the shine that we've been talking about since you know, 1991, well before anybody, Canadian authors, uh, young environmental organizations were talking about you know, a Green New Deal. We were talking about the principles of environmental justice. We were talking about the Hamas principles for democratic organizing. It was nothing um, new to us at all. And in, in many respects, you know, the so-called Green New Deal wasn't even going as far enough as um, the, the 17 principles of environmental justice of, of 1991, when we were talking from the get-go about free power and informed consent for um, indigenous communities and indigenous sovereignty. We recognized tribal and indigenous sovereignty from the get-go. It didn't become a cool buzzword or a concept for us post Standing Rock, right? This, this was a part of our tenets from the get-go. The idea of nuclear energy being a false mechanism for a clean or renewable energy economy. We rejected that back in 1991. Um, we uh, centered the fact that um, anti-Blackness and white supremacy are a major part of the climate crisis, right? That going after the root causes of the climate crisis. So, you know, there is something somewhat rewarding and, and also somewhat troubling that we're seeing, um, you know, the Biden um, campaign picking up on some of the uh, concepts that we have been speaking about for literally decades, whether it's ensuring that um, a vast uh, amount of um, investments are going to our communities, are going to the 48217, are going to Indian country to help shepherd this just transition. We're seeing policies that um, our people in states like New York uh, uh, developed with the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, or our people in California leading the way for public banking in California and, and just transition um, um, initiatives all over the country being led by our folk, um, um, energy democracy and food sovereignty um, um, aspects as well. Finally, you know, like, oh, we need to scale this out. You know, the, the, these solutions have been working for, for some time. So, you know, a, a lot of people like to say uh, another sort of new catch buzz phrase is this idea of another world is possible. But for us in our communities, we are have and, and are saying another world is happening. You know, we're not like waiting for, for what's possible. We're implementing what's possible. And, um, and I think that the reason why we are, 
you know, clearly the, the best grassroots organizers, uh, uh, arguably in the world, is because we understand and have understood for a long time that the farther your organization, the farther your lawmakers, the farther your fundraisers are from the people being directly impacted by a challenge or a set of challenges, the farther you are from active and mutual accountability. And, and for us, we also understand that accountability does not equal punishment as much as it's the process and the processes of establishing and maintaining right relationship with land and water and therefore right relationship with our communities and therefore right relationship uh, with each other. And that's what it's all about. So I'm really, really happy to be here. And thank you so much again for having me. And Sister Sawatu, it's so, it's, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm sticking you out, sis, but it, it just does me so well to see you um, smiling, happy and healthy. It, it's really good for my heart. So it's, it's good to see you, sister. I, I think um, Sister Sawatsu will just let you introduce yourself and then um, set set the stage. You know, I get the plates out and then we'll we'll, we'll fill the plates with the the food of your wisdom. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Sawatsu Salamara. Um, uh, I'm a mother and Detroit organizer here, um, focusing on many different fronts. Um, I I come from um, a movement community and movement family, right? Um, and so I've been rooted in the environmental justice and climate justice movement since I was a young one. Um, I come from a single mother who was also an organizer and activist. Um, and so I was privileged to learn the language of justice at a young age. And um, and and that has been my work, right? It's been something that um, I've only done, which is to advocate and fight for my community, fight for people who look like me, um, uh, and all people who are on the side of um, justice and freedom and liberation for all people. Um, and, but more so uh, this new journey that I've been on because of um, my own story of um, being impacted by a brutal and unjust system, which is um, the mass incarceration or the prison industrial complex. Um, through my own story of incarceration where um, I say that my pregnant body was kidnapped by the system and sent to serve two years in prison for protecting myself and my family. Um, because black women don't deserve to do those kinds of things. And um, we're, we're seen as, as a, a threat. And so, and not um, as people who feel um, and people who are afraid in our communities because of the conditions of our communities. Um, and so recently my, my my um, new focus around uh, how I identify justice or how I uh, am accountable to all of you is through um, understanding how the prison industrial complex relates to environmental justice and climate justice. Um, how, 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 do we, uh, how are we understanding and build the, building the capacity that we need to challenge the same systems that exploit and extract from our communities and lands? Um, that also extracts people from their communities and lands. Um, and how are we understanding that? Um, so that's been uh, some of the new work that I've been focusing on. Um, and, and also thinking about a world without prisons, thinking about a world without pollution, thinking about a world without police. Um, and like, what does that? And so th th those are like these very, um, beautiful imaginary uh, practices that we have been um, seeing, you know, for quite some time, right? It's, you see it all over, right? The uprisings in the, in the streets. You see right now the campaigns to free the mall. Right now you see the campaigns to cancel rent. You see the campaigns um, to, to, to close down more detention centers and abolish ICE and abolish prisons and uh, defund the police. All of that is that comes from our abolitionist framework and strategy. That comes from, that also comes from um, the the deep uh, commitment to visionary, uh, revolutionary um, thinking and um, and thought. So yeah, uh, um, it, though this is a time that has brought a lot of pain and loss, this is uh, the most uh, transformative moment that I've ever seen in my lifetime this is and this is also something that my mother says who who grew up in the in, uh, in the 50s and in the 60s who witnessed segregation and she said that this time is is our time so you are mm. I think you should be very excited and 
uh, and grateful for what this is. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sister Sawatu. Uh, Sister Reinhardt, um, you know, building off uh, of that, I mean, you know, of uh, uh, what Sister Sawatu was talking about is that, that, you know, so many challenges, so many crises facing our people. And I, I was wondering, you know, after obviously introducing you, yourself briefly, if you can also talk about the incredible work that you've observed and that are, you know, you're, you're a part of from your perspective, you know, especially as we're talking about right relationship with land and right relationship with each other. And, you know, despite all these challenges, how we are, you know, surviving and thriving um, against all odds, even though we're not shocked ourselves because we know our people are primordially powerful. Right. Ani, Anthony, uh, so miigwech for that. Uh, my, so bonjour everyone. My name is Beat Alvin Reinhardt. <clears throat> um, I'm an Anishinaabe Ojibwe of the Sioux St. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, as Jamisa mentioned before. And uh, I really appreciate being part of this panel discussion. Um, I, all of you have been involved in this, um, these grassroots organizations and community organizing a little bit longer than I have. So I really, I love hearing what you guys have to say as well. Um, for me, it comes down to um, <clears throat> the fact that, like, as an Indigenous woman, like, we are the, the we were, we were the original inhabitants of this land. Um, we also happen to be, like, one of the, we were the first to be, have these environmental injustices uh, put upon us with colonization, dispossession, relocation, and whatnot. Um, and so this fight has, like, it, for some people, this fight started four years ago, but for us, it started 500 years ago. And so that's, like, one of the main, um, one of the main reasons why like I'm doing what I'm doing um like the, the ideas of my ancestors to build a better future for future generations um like I am living in that generation right now and what, what we do today is going to impact seven generations in the future um so like especially with like what's going on in the world today um we are especially with COVID and whatnot we're losing our elders we're losing our like these this knowledge that we've been passing down through the generations so when we look towards like re-envisioning re a future for black indigenous people of color and whatnot it's building these relationships making looking at the interconnections between our communities and that's what i hope to like continue working on um with as part of this uh this fellowship that i'm part of as well like bridging the gap between urban and rural communities the issues that uh, are in rural communities, such as me and um, Rebecca Williams in our tribal communities is a lot different than what uh, people in like Detroit or Grand Rapids or other urban areas would uh, face. And so, yeah, I just, I'm really uh, happy to be part of this, uh, this talk t uh, today. So I will pass it over to Becca. Miigwech. Buju. Sorry, I was having some camera issues. Uh, Rebecca Williams, Indigenous, um, poking and bending, dipping dogwis. Um, so talking about climate justice and where um, I stand in our community, kind of reflecting on what Bidabin said, you know, as Indigenous people, um, the climate is really important to us, especially because we're brought up believing in, um, in the importance of our environment and really appreciating it and being taught that really is, as youth and and within our community and reflecting that um, and, and daily living and everyday life and just carrying that legacy on to our, our own children. And um, just talking about things about, um, you know, just where we're at today and like the difference from where we were before. I think there's a huge difference from um, the movement when the movements began back in like the seventies and the difference from then and now, I think it's so different because we have the ability to communicate on such a larger scale, you know, across the nation and worldwide, you know, not, not just within indigenous communities, all communities, um, utilizing things like social media. And we have the ability to make such a larger impact and, and um, so many more opportunities. And, um, and, I, and I can see that happening and we see that happening. And um, so it's, it's really exciting. And as indigenous people, um, we can certainly feel that movement within our communities and seeing the movements happening throughout other communities and to be able to see the support uh, across the different groups of minorities, people of color, and being able to um, embrace and support each other. It's really moving and, um, 
and just coming through together as a united front is just it's amazing so that's it for me glitch thank you so much rebecca good to have you here um th the next question i have for all three of you because i mean i think this is such an important part about our, our respective and mutual cultures is um how does our healing um, and our relations and relationships play a role for Black and Indigenous folk in the struggle um, as we're, uh, you know, pushing and pursuing a more just future. What, what, how, how does that art and culture um, really impact and inform our organizing and, and our mobilizations? And um, uh, any of y'all can start because I, I can't wait for this answer. Yeah, um, I think it's it's uh, art and culture has has been something that has never been separate from the movement. It's always been integrated. It's always been a a, a given that it that exists, and that's how uh, it's how it sustains us, right? It's how it's how we we stay um, committed. It's how we stay uh, energized. But then I'm also thinking of um, particularly with the Black um, community um, and how it is our duty to, um, to reimagine ourselves um, in terms of uh, our own healing to, in our own relationship to this land also, right? Yes, this is um, uh, indigenous land and, 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 and we, we want to make sure that we name that every single time. But this is also, uh, this land also has a very long, rich uh, history and contribution from African indigenous people as well. Um, and so um, I'm thinking of uh, like the things and practices um, and tradition that, uh, that has sustained our, our own thinking and and ability to to push through um, that has a lot of relationship to and a lot of similarity to uh, my comrades and siblings uh, from the indigenous communities as well, and so um, that's that's not something that we we often talk about. But I always push the envelope and um, and uh, and and want to bring that into the spaces that uh, we share a lot of the similar similar um, practices and beliefs which sustains us all to continue to push forward and, and um, to, to, to uh, make sure that um, we're present in this space and in this movement. But, but then also I don't wanna create new work, right? We don't need new work, y'all. Like we don't, we, 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 I think that the technology, the technology of our own brains, the technology of our own DNA, that everything that we are is exactly what we need to uh, to push forward and, and to reimagine uh, this new world that is happening and to continue to happen, right? Um, we share a lot of similar thoughts around thinking ahead, seven generations. That's, that's also a, a, a very similar teaching and, uh, and thought, uh, political thought or spiritual thought that we often keep in mind in our own communities as well. Um, and so to me, our healing looks like mamas and babas taking some time off and and uh, organizations and nonprofits actually supporting the work of organizers. Um, I think that it looks like allowing our children to be in these spaces. Uh, it looks like sharing food with one another. It looks like ho hosting healing circles where we're touching on one another, loving on one another. I know that's not happening right now, right? Because we're suffering and going through this pandemic, but we can still hold these spaces um, to make sure that we're loving and looking out for one another. So I think it's just really people just continuing to do what, what we've already learned that sustains us, especially through this pandemic, right? We've, we've shown up to one another's doorsteps with food. We have shown up in ways that uh, uh, making sure that our, the protection and safety of, of, of our loved ones and community members are um, are met. Um, and so it's, I don't think it's new work that we should create in terms of healing, but actually uplifting the practices that we know uh, that sustains our community right now. Um, mm. up those things right now. Thank you, sister. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to add anything before we go to Sister Reinhardt about just this idea of like how, you know, integral 
and axiomatic our our culture and our art um, is to our organizing and how we operate and uh, with each other and um, in 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 a, in a larger context of right relationship with land and water. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I like the idea of talking about art and culture, especially understanding who we are and where we come from is really important. Understanding, um, you know, the teachings of your people, like we talked about our seven uh, understanding our um, the teaching that we think about seven generations ahead is really important as indigenous people and and, and of course from other cultures and um, um, you know how we're all relatable and that we all probably have the same morals and, and understandings at the end of the day and that we all really believe in um, believe in supporting in climate and climate justice and things like that but um, the bigger picture is that I believe we could all come together and support one another. And one of the things I did want to say about it is that um, I did listen to somebody, um, his name is Sean King, he's a really um, important activist. And he, when I listened to him, he talked about how, um, you know, through our own arts and culture, uh, we can all come together with all of our experiences and those things as a united front, but it's really important to have really four important key points. And he said, you need to have like energized people, which we clearly have. You have to have a, um, a strategic plan, a very thought out plan. You have to have support, so like funding. And then you have to have, what was the last one? Oh, um, um, energized people, organizations, sophisticated plan, and then um, support and resources. And then with all those things you guys, uh, we have, the ability to do anything. And just think about the opportunities as people with, um, with all of our art, culture, experiences, and um, coming together and collaborating and all those resources to do something and make um, some amazing movements happen. Thank you so much for that. And Sister Reinhardt, um, any additions uh, to, to this importance of art and culture and how we operate? Yeah, so the importance of art and culture and how we operate, like in, in terms of like our mobilization of our communities and um, our relationships, that's like, that's one word I, I like kind of picked up on when you first asked the question is our relationships. And like one thing that I really um, want to emphasize is that it's not just a relationship to each other as like humans, it's like also to the land, like our relations further than humankind. So the animals, the plants, the land, the water, the air, all of that is like a huge component of what environmental justice is about, um, is that we can voice for the voiceless, for the animals, for the plants and whatnot. Like that's like really like a part of um, what we're doing and trying to heal. We're trying to heal ourselves and our environment as well. Um, in terms of art and culture, I just, um, I really liked what Suatu said in our chat here that organizing is our art. Um, that this is like what we do. I really appreciate that. And so I would, um, if you would like to emphasize on that a little more Suatu as well, like I just really appreciate uh, you saying that. Cause like when, when people think of art, they think of painting and sculptures and stuff like that. But everyone has an art form, whether it's spoken or video but this is what we do like organizing community organizing that is our art so i really appreciate that chimigwetch thank you mm. yeah no i i i saw that when sister swatsu put that in the chat and i was like I'm, I'm stealing that bumper sticker hashtag um and whatnot we'll we'll send you the uh, proceeds sister swatsu don't worry <laughs> <laughs> we make some money off of those t-shirts but um I, I think like one of the the great things about having y'all on this panel is something i want to ask you all um obviously um you know this summer um we we all saw a, a a massive increase in in um violence against uh black and brown bodies um, you know, we, uh, the specifics, including the lynching of George Floyd, the assassination of Sister Breonna Taylor, et cetera, et cetera. And um, one of the things that really moved me, I'm, I'm here um, currently for the uh, time being um, in um, present day Omaha, Nebraska, um, occupied uh, Winnebago, Omaha, Lakota territory. And um, for the last month, they have been um, every two weeks holding um, sweats, um, healing sweats for, for black people for, for you know, to, to join them in, in prayer. And because, you know, they've just, 
seen like, yo, you know, there's, there, there are no government like programs helping these folk with, with the healing. And, and I've, I've had the honor of taking part in them. I mean, I've become almost addicted to it because we, we, we pray together in, the, in these sweats and I've gotten used to it. I, I'm able to stay through, through all four doors now without like having to run out. <laughs> I'm really happy about that. But, um, and then we, we have this incredible meal together. And I was wondering if um, all of y'all can talk about some of the specific ways you've seen this manifestation, um, you know, in 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 in, in present-day Michigan of um, Afro-Indigenous solidarity and how um, that how important that is to our futures um, in the sense that our liberations are indeed tied together. Um, Rebecca, uh, uh, Sister Reinhardt, Sister Swatchel all touched on that, but I'd love um, if, if you could uh, uh, expand on that, this idea of um, Afro-Indigenous solidarity. And uh, Bitabai, maybe we'll start with you. Hi, uh, B. Dauban. B. Dauban, I, I'm so yes. sorry, I'll get it right next time. You're good, miigwech. Um, so yeah, so the solidarity between us, that like all of our communities especially, um, that is something that I just, I've seen flourish, I think, in recent years, especially. Um, I will be honest, I am, uh, I'm only 25. And so I've been trying to learn more. Um, and so I'd actually like to pass this off to Rebecca or Suwatu to begin our conversation on this one. I love the modesty though. That's, that's, that's what's up. Um, um, but this is intergenerational though and, and it was so great to have young folk on on this call but uh Rebecca did you want to uh, pick up on that sure yeah um so I can think of a few examples where I've seen it I'm not 25 so I maybe can have a little more experience but um not a whole lot more I can see where we have like progressively throughout the years come together more than we did previously like I can remember back when you know we had split I'm going to say like organizations right we had like um, American Indian movement, where it was like mostly um, native, native people, right? Um, and then we're like the Black Panthers, right? So you can see a clear, distinct groups not necessarily coming together to make um, bigger movements happen, you know, as um, coming together on a united front, right? But like in present day, not, ne not necessarily in Michigan specifically, although I have seen it happening, I think about like, um, um, Black Lives Matter movements. I see indigenous people from all over the state of Michigan coming to support Black Lives Matter. Uh, specifically in like Grand Rapids, I can remember um, just so many of our indigenous people and the people coming to Grand Rapids to support Black Lives Matter movements. Um, just like they were all over in Grand Rapids, right behind everybody um, to support those movements, that movement. And um, it was just, it was moving. And um, that's like one specific example. Um, another example I can think of was the um, I Don't Know More movement. That was just, um, I think that was one of the most recent movements of um, indigenous people. Um, I wanna say that was probably like 10 years ago maybe. Um, and we had uh, really good support from different communities. And then another one was Standing Rock. Um, that was a really important one where we had a lot of support from just like everybody. It was just amazing. Everybody from anywhere came from <laughs> I feel like all over the world. It was just phenomenal. And so I think, um, yeah, that's where I see a lot of different um, people coming together from different backgrounds coming and whether, um, you know, they're African-American, Native American, um, just I'd say like any back, you know, any minority, um, any minority group coming together to support each other, really, uh, regardless of who they are. Um, yeah, I feel like there's there's definitely been a shift. This is Watu. Yeah, um, this has been a, a topic that I have always been interested in, in terms of um, not only uh, how do we build, how do we continue to deepen uh, indigenous and black uh, uh, indigenous solidarity, but I was more so interested as like as this as this young organizer, right? Who would who would often be in these national spaces where I would visibly could feel and see the divide, right? The divide where you would see all the indigenous folks 
on one side and then you always had the black folks that was they they normally they didn't even have a side they would have to have a corner right um right but, but um as, as, that's and I, and i'm i'm not saying that that that's bad because abs the absolute most transformative work that has come out of this movement has come out of those small uh mm. Spaces that was like separate from the, the agenda um, and was emergent um, from Black communities, and as and that's that has been some of the ways that we've been leading a lot of our organizing efforts to transform and change the system. Um, but as a young person, I've always had those questions, like, "What is it?" Like when I and I will. I would go to my mom, like, mom, what, what is it? What is it? What, what, what happened? Like, can you tell me what happened in the year that I was born, right? Which was 91, which was exactly the same year that the environmental justice principles uh, came about, right? You had, you had, um, um, and, and something happened in 91. And I, I, I encourage all of us to continue to dig. Um, but that's what colonization does, right? It, it, it does, um, it, it, it gives us this false idea that our communities need to be uh, that my liberation or my work to 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 liberate my community um, is separate um, or not mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, also the same the, the liberation that I fight for other communities right um, and, and we've seen that with with the Black Lives Matter movement right is um, we've seen the the most solidarity multiracial movement that has happened in my lifetime is right now, right? I've seen um, where indigenous uh, communities have showed up with uh, so uh, so much much um, experience and, and, and guidance and uh, story and practice um, to, to give as a gift to, uh, to African uh, American black communities, you know, and that's how we've been thriving. And so, but also I don't want to say that that hasn't come out of painful and hard conversations. And so that's what, that's what this is. This with the reason why you see the type of solidarity between these two communities uh, is because people have been committed to having these deep, painful, hard conversations that actually get to the root of the impact of white supremacy uh, that it has had on our communities, right? The, the false narratives, the false stories that um, these two communities are not the same, right? Um, and that we're not fighting for the same um, vision and, 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 and new world that we all deserve. And in fact, we found that we've, we've have so much in common. And, and, and I think right when I came home from prison, I met this beautiful um, indigenous woman and we, we just, we we clicked and we we often um, share so many stories and I was I wanted to just tell her as if you know like as if she was my mother like how many things that we have in common and uh, and and she was uh, you know has also been um, someone who I have looked to when it comes to uh, guidance and 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 thought uh, and how to show up in this community and show up in this work. You know, so the solidarity has always been. I'm thinking about the Ind uh, Indigenous Environmental Network with Tom Goldtooth. Um, I'm thinking about all of the ways that he's shown up and um, in, in, uh, in response to the, uh, the racist attacks by white vigilantes and militia um, people uh, on the black community. He's always shown up, um, and 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 our. And so that's what that looks like. That's what this new world looks like is, is a new wave of solidarity, local, uh, national solidarity, but also international solidarity. Um, that's how the civil rights movement was so strong, right? Was because of the solidarity that existed in the multiracial uh, movement right now. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, painful, but it's happening. It's right. painful. No, that's what's up. Beautiful. That's what's up. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about that, you know, um, we, we've had the, the blessed opportunity to be working very closely with Representative Deb Holland from New Mexico, of course, one of two um, Native women in the United States Congress right now. And I had a chance to like, you know, do a one on one with her. Sister Holland is, is very direct. I, I, I promised her I would make her laugh one day and I actually didn't. I'm gonna send you all the picture because like I, I made her laugh and I was like, yo, but you know, she really impressed upon me that like why missing murdered indigenous women is an environmental justice issue and was like, you know, think about it from the context of Africa, you know what I'm saying, or like how many of our people 
missing, murdered, you know, and whatnot, indigenous people to Africa. And then imagine the idea of being missing and murdered on your own land, you know what I mean? And, and when you, uh, you know, take it in from that perspective, it's like, yo, this is definitely an environmental justice issue, especially when you add in the fact that these man camps uh, for these pipelines of death and these black snakes are a are, 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 are big uh, component of that. Uh, but um, um, Bidabin, I was, I'm not gonna let you off the hook because like, you know, um, as our resident young person, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, in, in the context of everything we're talking about, what is the role of young black and indigenous folk um, from the lens of uh, an intergenerational struggle, which is something that you know, um, you know, your, your people have, have definitely um, espoused. Um, Sister Rebecca talked about Standing Rock. A lot of folk don't realize like how integral indigenous youth were in in getting Standing Rock up and running and maintaining it. You know, um, whether it was folk who were jogging all the way to DC. And, and how young folk were, were real like leaders in that. And I remember when there was one council meeting, there's a little bit of tension because the young folk wanted to be a little more agitating, right? And, and our elders um, were talking more about prayer. And this young person said, you know, due respect to my aunties and my grandmas and my uncles, y'all prayed and we showed up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, 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 and here we are. But, um, and then of course the tradition of, um, the black radical tradition of Ella Baker, you know, who, who, who of course instilled this idea of you know this is young folk and, and sister Ella would just get out of the way. So I, I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are um, in, in this day and age where y'all aren't waiting for some torch to be passed to you, understanding that your futures right now that that special role that that young folk like yourself play in in, in this struggle. That's what I'm honestly. That's what I'm seeing. Like more and more is that like it's well, at least in the circles that I keep, it's very cross-cultural like everything that we do is cross-cultural like if i if like the missing and murder indigenous women act um black lives matter and stuff like that like we are helping each other like all the time like there's no question about it it's not a will you show up it's like when like we know that like we we are already in the movement together like we support one another for each of our movements and so like i feel like and like the, one of the main things that i have i have seen and that um like uh, on like social medias and whatnot is that when like for instance with the with black lives matter like uh i saw like some older generations were starting to be like well what about us what about the indigenous people that have been killed as well and like people like my age and younger have been like had to just like shut them down like no this is not about us right now we're here to support our our black relatives and whatnot like that is like that's like a show of solidarity and in terms of we're not trying to co-op this movement we're trying to raise them so all of us lift together and so I think I think like that's one of like the main things that I've seen with my generation and uh, younger is that like we are just ready to show up no matter what, um, and uh, like and, and then it, as like even like within this like pandemic and stuff like that like I um I didn't actually go to many of the marches just because like of COVID and whatnot but I like helped as much as I could but it was mainly people like my age and whatnot and like everyone was just there together, um but like we always we also knew that if like I am like I'm indigenous, but this is not like my, this is not my uh, movement. So I'm here to support, but not take the reins, not like do like the voicing. And the same with, um, with Standing Rock, for instance, um, with uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, that was, um, that was started by uh, youth and the women in that community. Um, and as soon, like and when I was there, um, Rebecca was there as well, my family was there. Like we, they made sure to know, like, um, when, when anyone new got there, that this, that unless you were from Standing Rock, that that is their movement. Like they will be the ones to talk to the press, to everyone like that. Like we are here to support, but we are not here to like take over basically. And so I feel like that's like the main like show, so, show of solidarity is that like we are here to support one another, lift each other up and that way we can all um, move forward uh, with a just future together for sure. You know, thank you so much for that. So, um, you know, my, my last question, which I think is is so important, um, you know, uh, uh, for for this panel, um, before I kick it back to Sister um, uh, Janisa, is I'm wondering if y'all can talk about that special, unique sauce 
uh, within Michigan, Detroit, the D, the Upper Peninsula, um, of your organizing um, that, that the rest of the country and the rest of the climate justice movement needs to know about. Because I experienced it myself. I finally, you know, I, I uh, when I do fly, I exclusively fly uh, Delta Airlines. So I had many times where I like landed in the D, but never really like got to go into the D. And the airport has nothing to do with the city, by the way, right? The airport's like basically in, in Kansas, it seemed like. But um, in the weeks that I did get to spend um, with, with your, your folk on the ground, you know, there y'all have some like unique thing. And, and I'm wondering if you can articulate that because I only articulated it as, as badass, but like that's not specific enough. But, but what is it about Michigan, the Upper Peninsula and the D that, that, that is unique and, and, and makes y'all so powerful, so resilient, so persevering that could be a, a lesson for the rest of the climate justice community and for um, organizers writ large. Um, let's start with uh, you, Rebecca. Um, well, I'm not from Detroit or the UP, so I don't know if I can, do you want me to still answer the question? <laughs> you just I mean, if you've, exper if you've experienced like some of the, some of the bad ashes I have, maybe, I mean, that's, that's even like better. Like you have the same perspective <laughs> as I do. So we'll start, we'll start with the outsiders and then we'll, we'll okay. go on to the, uh, to our resident <laughs> Michiganers. Yeah. 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 I, I think it comes down to like resiliency, right? Like the need to thrive and, um, push against the norms like um yeah I feel like uh clearly uh you have this need and desire to protect yours your family your your community and you know that some people I think just have like this this sense of um and drive to do what's right and I think that's what I see yeah like like the, the energy, right? The energy to organize. And that's what I see coming, especially from Detroit well, and the UP, but <laughs> maybe a little quieter in the UP, but they're definitely energized up there too. Um, but uh, for sure from Detroit, like Detroit is so passionate about, especially when I hear about them speaking about like the environment, like they're passionate, like relentless, relentless because they care. They want their kids to have you know, a clean environment and to be able to look forward to having a clean environment and like who doesn't want to have that for their kids. And that's, that's what I think when I see it, um, you know, people from the UP and from Detroit or in other communities as well. No, you're so right about that, you know, without um, embarrassing your uh, sister Michelle Martinez, of course, with MEJC. Um, you know, when she came and got me from my hotel, the first time I was like in Detroit proper, she took me to the water. And um, and just like went off on this beautiful soliloquy and just pointed. She was like, "It's about this, you know." She was like, "Like, look at what we're doing to this. Like, like without this, there's nothing else to talk about." And I was like, "All the organizers like in the D like this because like they're about to win a lot. <laughs> you know, this is amazing." But um, uh, Bidavin, I'm wondering if you if you can build it like. What is your secret sauce? What, what is it about the organizing that does keep us so um, so hopeful and so energized when we see what's coming out of Michigan, the D and Upper Peninsula? Well, I think that you hit on a really important part right there. It's just, it's the water. Like we are surrounded by like the largest freshwater lakes in the world. And there's three of them that are connected to us. And so like, I know that with, um, I, I can only really speak on the UP just cause like, this is where I'm from, like generations and that one whatnot now, like this is our home. This is, and so like when we see the injustices and the destruction, the mining, the fracking, the pipelines across our lands, that is like something that really just like, honestly just like grinds our gears. Like this is like my land and you you wanna come in here and freaking pollute it. And I just, yeah, I'm just passionate. Yeah, we're passionate about like keeping this place like healthy for not just like not just for tribes like like yeah like we have our, our sovereign rights we have our treaty rights we have our ceded territories and whatnot and so that's like a really big part of it and why I think that a lot of like the um like the the voices you hear might be from indigenous communities from the UP um but that's because we have our sovereign rights we have our sovereignty so we're able to like voice these things and say and like actually like make um like political changes and that's what people listen to they listen to politics and listen to money and since we don't have a lot of money we have we have a lot of politics so that's like what that's what that's what we do and that's like what we're fighting for our families for the water for keeping it like we don't want it to get worse we want it to keep 
as good as it can for now for, until we can like pretty much revamp the system like the like the institutional racism capitalism the everything that like we're trying to we're trying to fight against to like um basically yeah like we're trying to keep it as good as we can until we're able to like become majority enough to like get get our voices not just this quiet little voice the pot the individual passionate voices all over the all over the state all over the country but until we can get like a vast majority to actually make these like overhauling changes an actual paradigm shift and i think that's like what the um that's what i think at least so yeah no that's what's up and and sister so we're gonna let you anchor uh, uh this i mean I, I think that um again um your particular uh individual struggle which of course became a collective struggle really captured the imagination of a, of a lot of folk across the country and and again you know it's like there's something going on in the d so um what, what is what is that special sauce in the organizing in detroit yeah um there's a certain type of surviving or survival that happens when you literally cut off an entire uh people or city or a state from water from from uh being able to to feed themselves to being able to have jobs being able to uh have the necessities to 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 live uh uh quality of, to have quality of life right and so it's a certain what you see about us is that um for one detroit detroiters are hustlers right we've we've always been that and uh the rest of the of the country has um learned from that and so what you see is just people surviving surviving um we often talk about how detroit is its own country right we don't even identify as michiganders right mm. detroiters mm. Um, um, because the entire state of Michigan has also left us out, um, out of funding. Mm -hmm. They have taken over everything that we have. Every, they have taken over our, our island. They have taken our water. They have taken over um, just about everything that uh, made us a city, right? And, and they took it from us. Um, and so there's a type of survival um, that we had to learn um, to become and be resilient um, in terms of advocating for ourselves and fighting for ourselves. And so Mm. That's what people see. They see people surviving um, when mm. we weren't meant to weren't meant to survive. Um, they've taken everything, and so people are like, they left us to fend for ourselves, and that's what we've been doing. Um, that even in Detroit, you have uh, two narratives. You have Detroit One and Detroit Two, right? You have Detroit Two, who is mainly who gets all the, all of the resources that you see right now. That is pretty. That is beautiful. New buildings, new businesses. That's downtown, mm -hmm. you know, midtown. And then you got. Detroit one who I, I who I am accountable to who who I, I you know identify as and most of us are people who have been forgotten um, mm. the type of style that that comes with that there's a, a, a certain type of um, uh, uh, practice that comes with that um, and, and they often say like if you want to know the direction of the world take a look at Detroit you want to know about the type of organizing that needs to happen and look at Detroit. Um, so Detroit has always been that anchor um, within many different fronts of the movement, uh, not just the environmental justice movement, but the climate justice movement, the work around abolition, um, the work around food justice. Detroit has been that anchor, it ha has always been. And so many, many people who look to that organizing and look to the organizers who's holding down that work, I simply just mamas and babas and sisters and brothers and siblings just surviving um, mm. uh, uh, when we weren't meant to survive. And so mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a lot to learn from that. Well, I just want to say to all three of you sisters, like, thank you so much for um, allowing me to share space with you and, and to absorb some of your wisdom through the screen. Obviously, we long for the day where we can do this uh, together in person because that's when we're, we're at our best, but you, you have definitely given the people a, a, a taste of, 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 of why we are surviving and we are gonna be thriving as black and, and, and indigenous and brown and, and, and yes, and, and poor white folk as well. And um, you know, I, I would just say to, to the world and, uh, and the folks who are watching, yes, this is what you said it, you know, there's so many answers coming right out of uh, Detroit, right out of the upper peninsula and right out of uh, black, brown, indigenous and poor uh, white frontline communities and scaling out those solutions. So, uh, you know, um, and we're not going anywhere, you know, we haven't gone anywhere, as, as it was said, you know, in four or 500 years and, um, you know, uh, resiliency is also our art, just like organizing is, um, and so is perseverance. So 
um, with that, I'm gonna sign off and uh, kick it over to uh, my brilliant sister, uh, Jamisa, who probably should have like read her bio about herself, like JD, summa cum laude, lawyer, policy, you know, guru and whatnot, and, and very, very modest. Um, love working with you as always, Jamisa. And um, thank you so much again for, for thinking of me. This has like really been a good way to uh, start the uh, week because um, I pretty much canceled yesterday from ever having because of a certain confirmation. So um, <laughs> this is my Monday right here with you all. And I really, really appreciate, um, appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, Anthony. And thanks to each one of you for, you know, sharing your wisdom and your experiences. Um, I definitely think that everyone who's going to see this and who's attending is, is definitely going to be um, you know, transformed by your words and inspired as well. You know, every two years at MEJC, we host the statewide summit and we hope to offer a space and a place for EJ leaders across the state to showcase the work and, and lift up the voices of those who are most impacted by environmental injustice. And so, you know, we want to thank all of those who are doing the work to fight for a cleaner, brighter future for all people. We also want to thank the members of the planning committee, Ms. Teresa Landrum, uh, Catherine Savoy, uh, Latia Leonard, um, Amina Maxi, Brian Smith, Jeff Whitelow, for all helping to make sure that the summit happened this year in the midst of everything that's going on and to make sure that it happened online. Uh, we want to thank the Michigan Advisory Committee on the summit who really drove this vision and, and set the tone for this summit. And we also wanna take a moment and thank all of you, our generous supporters for your time, your donations, for your love for environmental justice as we fight this incredible and wicked battle together. We also like to thank our funders at the Fred and Barbara and Herb Family Foundation Transforming Power Fund, the Heartland Fund, Grassroots Power Fund, and the B Initiative for all the generous support of MEJC, its members, and the summit, as well as the Third Wave Foundation for supporting the Healing Justice Track, which is a new formation within the summit. The Healing Justice Track is actually offering the last session um, practices that sustain us from 3 to 5 p.m. And so there's still time for you to register for that last uh, summit session, and we hope to see you there. Again, I just wanna thank you for joining us in this space, and we hope that we've encouraged you to stay engaged and committed to a future where we can all thrive. Thanks, y'all.